you have your Bibles, you can turn to, ready for this, Roland? Matthew 25. Not Matthew 2, like I sent you. Matthew 25. The chapter 25. You all ready this morning? Amen. I'm going to preach this as quick as I can and uh, with as much passion as I can. Um, I, I realized something uh, after a while. I've been thinking I'm, I'm, I'm part pastor and part um, I don't know what to say. I don't fill that in. I left some real dead space there. I'm part pastor and I'm part activist. That might scare you, but I believe that God has birthed within me, and because I'm one of the pastors of this church, it is becoming a part of the DNA of this church, and, and that is uh, the DNA of a reformer. I had that word over my life many, many years ago that I would have my feet in two different things and places and that God would uh, use me to, uh, it's going to shock you, but to stir things up a bit. And um, I, I, I don't like to stir things up for the sake of stirring things up, but when I believe that things are uh, trending away from the heart of the Father, I, 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 I think that is, not, that is not a moment for us to be silent. Are you with me? When I believe that things are trending away from the heart of the Father, the true intent of the gospel, I don't believe that's a moment or a time for us to be quiet or silent. And, Rob, I'll say this, I don't believe it's a moment for subtlety. I believe we need to come out and say what we mean and mean what we say. Does that set you up? The title of this message is, Social Justice is Biblical Justice. I want to teach today on the life of Jesus in a way that will hopefully unlock your eyes to the potential that we have as the church to bring healing. I want to focus specifically today, I've focused on a lot of issues within our society in the last couple of years as I've spoken here and there, some things that are, have come up and issues and, society, and stuff that we are dealing with. I want to speak specifically today on racial equality and equity and the responsibility of the church to step up in this time. Thank you, Tucker. As a person of color, will you tell them that we need to hear this today? I'm not here to make a political statement or decide this way or to do this or to do that or get in, you know, you know, the enemy likes to divide. So the enemy always gives us these very uh, binary uh, uh, choices in society. So we have, are you this or are you that? Do you believe this or do you believe that? Are you here or are you there? Do you side with these people or you side with these people? And we have these binary choices. And the point of that is to, to categorize and to separate us and to keep us from uniting together and realizing that when people are hurting, we are all hurting. Come on. I believe Martin Luther King Jr. said that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Which means if there's an injustice in, in this city, there's, there's a threat to justice everywhere. And I believe that one of the core values of Jesus on the earth was to bring justice. Now, when I preach a message like this, the first thing that begins to come to mind for many of us is we feel insecure and threatened. There is nothing in, that you, could, you should feel insecure or threatened about today because nothing is coming for you. Nobody's trying to infringe on your rights or your beliefs or my beliefs or anything like that. I want to preach to you not on a, based on a political platform. I want to preach to you here today, and I'm going to dive right into it, based on the Word of God, based on this Scripture right here. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne, and before Him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's saying there's a separation that's coming between sheep and goats. And I've seen this used to manipulate churches and places. It's all the, you know, the minute you have a question or the minute you may disagree with something, you're labeled as a goat. And that means you're, you're out. 
That's not what I'm using this here today. I want to show you that there is, if you will, in the heavens, in, in, in the kingdom, in, 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 in here on the earth even, there is a, a separation between ideas or people within the church. And this is the way he separates us. Silly as it sounds, this is the way he divides us. There's two types of Christians out there. My question for you and I is, which one are we? Which one are we? Because this is how he describes it. He says to, the, to those, he says, um, he'll, he'll, he, the, king, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. He's describing, he's describing, in this case, the sheep. Not the sheep like we are robots and we obey somebody. We're talking about the good ones in this equation. The goats are the bad, the sheep are the good. That's a simple way to explain it. He says, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, of these my brothers, you did it for me. I love this because we say what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. But he puts a little twist in there. He says, what you've done to the least of these, my brothers. He says, I have a kinship with the naked and the poor and they're forgotten. I have a relationship with them. They are just as much my family as anyone else. He says, what you've done to the least of these, my brothers, you've done unto me. Woo! Do you know that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, I'm going to just get on it quickly here. Is that all right? The book of Isaiah says this in verse 53, prophesying about the king to come. We see Jesus blue eyed and beautiful riding on the white stallion, you know, like the conquering king. This is what Isaiah said about the Jesus, the Messiah to come. He says this, he says, for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty and we look when, that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't much to look at. Then he says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He was a reject. This is what Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus, that he fit in more with the rejects than he did with the elite that he fit in with those that were despised, that he wasn't much to look at. So when he says what you've done to the least of these, my brothers, he means it. Do you hear me today? Woo. Look at somebody and says he, he, he looks like he's got a humdinger. I find this interesting. Do you know when this particular, I, I love this because of, I'll tell you why I'm preaching this today. It's stinking Facebook, y'all. I've started blocking people, all right? Got me worked up. My mom is right. Because I saw a, a, someone I respect a post, repost a, a article in the Christian Post from a pastor out in California that said the following. Because there are pastors like me that are saying, as the church, we need to respond that if we have people of color in our society that believe that their lives are in danger or threatened, if we have people of color who are in fear, if we have people of color who, who feel like they're unfairly targeted or whatever else, we don't have to debate whether we think we have the right for this or that or the other. But if we have people that are hurting, that are people of color, people, minority groups, people that, I want you to think about this for a moment. The, the people in this room that have skin that looks like Tucker's, they got a 250 year delay versus our ancestors in this country. We got a 250 year head start. They couldn't own property. They couldn't build a business. They didn't even have their own names. The Johnsons and the Smiths and that that we see out here, you have a, 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 a black man with the last name Johnson. He came from a plantation. That name was given to him. That wasn't the name that he got when he was brought here on a boat. That wasn't his name. 
He was given that name as a label for who owned him. People of color still carry the names generations later for what they were labeled, like, like stamping or branding a, a piece of cow, a, a cow. They belong to this farm. Still carrying those names. Hey, guys, we got to be real. 250-year head start that some of us with this skin color got. There is no way that 100 years later, all that's been worked out. We didn't even hit civil rights till the 50s and 60s. We're, we're a little over 50 years into this. We got some work to do and seeing some equity and equality in our nation. And it's okay. It's not a threat to my whiteness. It is the heart of God. It is the heart of the Father. I'm not a target. I'm not a victim. I remember when George Floyd was, his knee was, that, that knee of the officer, that, that, that trial is going on right now. I remember when he, if you watched it and you didn't, weren't emotional or didn't think to yourself, something is wrong here. I, I don't know what to tell you. If that was your brother, your dad, you wouldn't care if he had gotten high the hour before. It was, he was supposedly resisting arrest, but the officer had his hands in his pocket. Now, I'm not an expert, but if somebody's resisting me pinning them to the ground, I'm not going to have my hands in my pocket. Let's be real. We got that going on, and I remember interviewing and doing a, 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 a Facebook Live with Dwight Josie and Michael Kinsey and both men of color and, and, and talking to them. And they said, Dan, I don't know if you realize this, and this was such a revelation to me, I didn't even think about it. I guarantee you most of us in this room don't even think about this. But they said this is a real thing within the African-American culture, black culture in America, where the young men specifically, before they go out with their friends or go out at night, they will go through a checklist of things with them their grandpa, their, their dad, their mom, their aunt. Make sure you've got your wallet. Make sure it's in a place in your car you can get to it easily. If you get stopped, put your hands on the steering wheel. Say yes, sir, and no, sir. Don't resist. Don't talk in as clear of uh, uh, English as you can. Don't make any sudden movements before you grab anything. Make sure you tell the officer that's pulling you over exactly what you're doing before you do it, and do it very slowly. And I don't care how unfair it is. I don't care if you feel like you're being unfairly targeted. Do whatever you are told. How many people with skin color like mine in this room have that conversation with their kids before they go out? Three. Well, he's Italian. It doesn't count. All right. I know you're not. <laughs> he's from New York. Three. Didn't, my dad never had that conversation with me. He wasn't worried. This is real, guys. This isn't some made-up political agenda. This is real. My point in this is saying, and all that is saying this, if it is important to the heart of God, it should be important to my heart and yours. The, the, the disenfranchised and the, what would be considered the people of color of the day, whether it was Jew or Gentile, whether it was Samaritan, whatever it was, Jesus was constantly making a point to say, they, they belong in the same place as the rest of you. They belong to having access to the same God. They can come to the Father just like you can. He broke down cultural uh, issues and problems. And is, is she all right? Okay. Sorry. She's in good hands. She, he, he, he broke down every barrier that had been set up by culture. And I want to read this to you in Luke. Jesus walks into the synagogue and he's, he's beginning his ministry. Check this out. He's beginning his ministry. He walks into the synagogue. I'm going to get back to that blog in a moment because I want to finish with that. And they hand him the entire book of Isaiah. There's over 50 chapters. They say, Jesus, he's in Nazareth. He's in his hometown. It's like, what message do you want to send to your hometown people now that you got your big ministry, Jesus? Here's the book of Isaiah. Pick something. And Jesus is like, I'd love to. And he says this. This is what he says. This is, the chat. This is, this is his message to his hometown people. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. 
The uh, question is, who are oppressed in our nation? And if this was close to the heart of Jesus when he went back to his hometown, what kind of responsibility do we have in our own hometown? I, uh, the reason I wanted to speak on this today is that there's this thing that was posted and got me all worked up. And it's because I want to read to this to you. Pastors like me, there's a lot out there, um, not as many as there should be. We're in the minority, definitely, who aren't afraid to bring up some of these issues and say, we have to be the answer to this problem and we cannot ignore it. It's uncomfortable to talk about, but it's real. And, and pastors like me uh, that are doing that are getting incredible hate from the majority of Christian leaders out there. Hate that looks like this. I want you to think about this for a moment. This is a, I'm not gonna name him, but this is a very well-known pastor of a mega church in California said the following. The biggest problem in America is a lukewarm church that is bowing at the altar of race. So if I wrap my arms around a mama whose son got a bullet in his back when he was unarmed as she's grieving, you're going to tell me I'm bowing at the altar of race and making a false God out of race? This should make you mad. He said somehow race just became God. He goes on to quote Thomas Jefferson, which is so absurd. I can't even tell you when we're talking about race. He, he literally goes and says that we have somehow made race a false God and that, we, that race has become God. Well, buddy old pal, let me tell you something. The Bible says that what you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. And so if there is a race that has been beat down for hundreds of years and that has not yet found their place of equity and equality the way they should, and there's still some major societal and systemic racism issues in our nation and in our people, and we do unto them as we would do unto God, the Bible says that we've done it unto him. I wanna make this point a little bit further. The least of these, you cannot make a God out of the least of these because when you do it unto the least of these, you are doing it to God. <laughs> do you hear me? You can't make a false God out of helping the disenfranchised, the poor, the broken. My parents spent 30 years reaching out to communities in, in this city that were that majority men, minority communities that were desperate, trying to give them an opportunity, give them a hands up, try to feed them and clothe them and love them. They spent 30 years doing it. They weren't making an altar uh, unto some false god. They were worshiping the king of kings with their lives as they laid down even their own finances to love and to do everything they could. It's not a false god. That's a bunch of nonsense. Can Pastor Dan be real with you right now? I call myself pastor because I'm trying to settle myself down. That is a bunch of crap. You're going to love people and be there for people and reach out and unite people and bring people together under the banner of God's love and mercy, and that's creating a false God? Then I don't want to be that kind of Christian. Can I drop a bomb on you right now? I told a friend of mine this week, I don't think I'm a Christian anymore. Now, before you get yourself all hyped up, I don't want to be a Christian if that's what being a Christian is. Full of hate, full of division, full of, you know, kicking people when they're down, full of just nasty theology that kicks and, and, and mocks and beats down people that want to help people. You want to help people and now you're worshiping false gods? Church, if you think I'm taking this out of context, you, you got to read this article. It's crazy. The sad thing part is, is it got posted thousands of times on social media, shared. And from our community, what I saw from our community here, the Christians and the Christian leaders unanimously, other than me, unanimously approved of this article. Right on, bro. Oh, that's exactly my thoughts. I, I wanna say this to you. I'm not 
trying to start something. Maybe I, you know what I am? I'm trying to start something. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying to start a revolution of Christians that actually want to stand up for one another and not, not, not allow us to be divided and not allow us to be categorized and welcome all peoples from all places, from all denominations and races and lifestyles. Welcome them all into the kingdom of God and love them where they're at. And if they have pain, I don't have a right to tell them they're not feeling pain. If they're scared, I don't have a right to tell them they shouldn't be scared. I'm going to meet them where they're at. I'm going to meet them with hope in the middle of fear. Come on. That's what the kingdom of God is. Guys, I, I, I spent time with leaders of local organizations that work uh, in, in some of the movements that are going on. And I, I've actually sat down face to face with some people that have had some really horrible encounters because of the color of their skin. And I've met them and I've looked them in the eyes and I've heard them tell me about their kids and how scared they are for them kids. It's real. I can feel y'all in this room, some of you going, Pastor Dan, do you hate cops? No, dummy. No. That's not what this is about. We fully support law enforcement. We fully support and believe. Listen, at the end of the day, if uh, I, as I hear a, uh, a window in my house smash as, as prepared, wink, wink, as I feel like I am, I'm pretty good with hiding in my closet and waiting for them to arrive, all right? I believe these men and women put their lives on the line every day. This is not an anti-law enforcement message. This is a pro-people message. And so just as much as I love their hearts and souls and their sacrifice, I also love the person of color that's worried when they get in their car and drive down the street. You could actually love both. <laughs> you could actually be concerned about both. You see how the everyone was like, do blue lives matter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they do. But guess what? Uh, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said Gentile lives matter. Jesus said Samaritan lives matter. Jesus said lepers' lives matter. Jesus said if there's somebody that's hurting, I'm not afraid to say their name. <laughs> Come on. And if they were a Samaritan, they needed acceptance. If they were a leper, they needed a new arm. If they were blind, they needed eyes. He was specific about who he loved and how he met them and how he restored them and how he healed them. And we need to be too. And it's going to take us having uncomfortable conversations that lead us to a place of healing and reconciliation. And I don't have all the answers, but I do know that we have a problem. And I do believe that if we will come together and drop whatever issues or problems or schisms or isms that we have and start living loving people the way Jesus loved them and get a heart for justice and do what he said, which is bring liberty to those that are oppressed. I believe that we can see some real change. Amen, church? Amen. Come on, stand up with me if you can. I want to read this to you. There's a big debate going on right now. It's this debate. Social justice versus biblical justice. I want to tell you today that social justice is biblical justice. I'm not talking about everyone's like, Pastor Danny, have you, I'm going to get real. Have you read some of the Marxist stuff on the Black Lives Matter movement? You know, uh, I, y'all, somebody puts up a website under a name, which I can do in about 30 minutes and write something down does not mean it represents every person that's out there fighting for the lives of black men and women. That's nonsense. It's just an organization that took advantage of the name and tried to franchise or incorporate it or become a nonprofit, but it does not represent the movement of people that are out there saying that if there is an injustice anywhere, it is a threat to justice everywhere. And so whether it's in our city or another city, we're going to be loud and say, if there is an injustice that anywhere. There is a threat to justice everywhere, and we will be a part of ha hanging with, loving on, and being there for those that feel, those that are experiencing fear, those that feel disenfranchised, those that need a, 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 an opportunity to have a voice, those that need an opportunity to, to be able to fight for themselves and lift their voices up. We are here to amplify that. We're here to make space for that. We're here to encourage them. We're here to stand behind them. I want to tell you what this church is going to do. There's a guy who doesn't even go to this church um, anymore who I'm friends with. I mentioned him earlier. His name is Dwight Josie. He's getting ready to start a food truck. You know what we're going to do as a church? He's a man of color. He's getting ready to start his own business. We're going to support him. 
We're gonna use our Facebook, we're gonna use our Instagram, we're gonna use our email list to sell him out on his opening day. Come on, and I'm gonna encourage you to go do it. So there's lots of ways that we can begin to change the dynamic. You might be a person with skin color like mine. We call you white, even though I don't think any of us are quite white, white. Off-white, tan, eggshell, whatever we are. You might have a business. We support your business too. Understand that we're trying to just level the playing field and we're doing it in a way where we're not going to harm your business. We're here to support you, but we wanna give an opportunity for people to express their, their hard-earned cash, their support in a practical way. So we as a church are gonna start doing things like that. We're gonna find people and we're gonna say in our community, and I'm gonna tell you this, there should be more black-owned businesses that are thriving in our community. Do you agree with me? Come on, do you agree with me? Why? Because we have kids running around the streets that need something to look up to and to say, you know what? I can do that one day. I can be that way. My uncle started this business three months ago and he just put a down payment on a house and he's the first one in my family that's ever gonna own a house. We need to begin to see that happen in our community. We need to begin to see kids have look up to somebody that looks like them and believe that it can happen to them too. And the only way that's going to happen, let's be real, the only way that's going to happen is those of us that have gotten a head start go back and say, come on. And you know what that is? That's the gospel. This reach back is the gospel. It's been that way. And some of you were there. Some of you were there. And somebody went, come on. You don't have to be there anymore. We want to help. That's it. If that offends you. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I have zero apologies. This is the gospel. This is Jesus. This is what he came to the earth. One of the things he came to the earth to say and do. Amen? Y'all love me? Good. Don't send me your hate mail. Send that stuff to PG. I'm not going to give your email address out. <laughs> we love you guys. Bless you. Just think about this. Spend some time with Jesus. We'll see you next week. Amen?